Praise the Lord. First, I'd like to take uh, 30 seconds of my time, the 25 minutes, to um, thank the church. I know that uh, many in the church supported the IPC Family Conference that took place last weekend. Um, and uh, there were singers, there were people behind the scenes, but especially the young people that came out and helped me in so many ways. I thank the Lord for such talented um, young folks and their heart of service and dedication uh, to the Lord. Um, so today I would like to bring you a story about two boys, two boys, and uh, their story is what I'll bring you today. As you know, we're studying about looking unto Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we talked about the forerunners. We talked about the birth and early life of Jesus and his entry into public ministry. Um, he's now calling his disciples. And uh, last two weeks ago, uh, Brother Joe talked about Simon Peter, the disciple that he had called, right? Today, we'll talk about the sons of Zebedee, sons of Zebedee. And so um, let me set myself up here. Zebedee were two boys, Jacob and Yohanan. Uh, Jacob ben Zebedee and Yohanan ben Zebedee. There were two boys that were um, in the father's fishing business, right? Their father, the Zebedee, had a very thriving fishing business in the Sea of Galilee, which is where they grew up. They were on the, um, they were born in Bethsaida in this fishing village, and they grew up and they were working with their father, as was the tradition at that time. If you did not go and get a rabbinical education and study under a rabbi, a rabbi uh, you would most likely end up taking the profession of your father. And so they were destined to be fishers, fishers of fish. But we see in John, in John chapter 1, verse 34 and 39, uh, Jesus calls his first disciples. Uh, from verse 34, 35 onwards, I like to read. The next day, John the baptizer was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. So we see John the Baptist doing his usual ministry, and, uh, which is to be the forerunner of Jesus, telling others that there is coming the Messiah right after me. And so he had disciples himself. And later we see that one of them was Simon Peter. We don't know the other person, but uh, based on a deduction of the Bible, we think it's one of these two boys. Uh, we see that Jesus walked by. They faced each other, and Jesus walked by. And John the Baptist is saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him saying that, and they followed Jesus. And that was the point. I, feel, I believe John the Baptist was successful in his ministry uh, where he could have two of his disciples say, when they, when, he, when they heard him say, Behold the Lamb of God, that they left John and they started following Jesus. They started to follow Jesus. Jesus turned to them and saw them following behind him and said, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. It was about the 10th hour. Another uh, key scripture portion uh, in the sermon titled, From the Sons of Thunder to True Genuine Disciples of Jesus, the story of Jacob and Yohanan ben Zebedee is Matthew chapter 4, verse 21 to 22. Matthew chapter 4, I'll, I'll read from 18 onwards because Joe touched on it the last time. And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightaway left their nets and followed him. Joe touched on this two weeks ago. Now I'll continue uh, from verse 21 on, onwards. 
And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So first, let's learn about Zebedee and Sons Shipping Company. We know that Zebedee is a Hebrew name, which means gift of God. And he was a first century entrepreneur, the father of these two boys, Jacob and Yohanan. Uh, he was well-to-do and wealthy. He was a devoted Jew with a great influence and even knew the high priest, right? Uh, he had a boat of multiple boats um, because later it says that when the boys left, he had hired men. Um, and so uh, that's how uh, they were able to um, make a living. So he was left with a hired men. So Zebedee was the fisherman father of two disciples, James and John, who was, men who was mending his fish, uh, mending his ship, mending their nets. And straight away, we see that Jesus called them. And these boys went after Jesus. There must have been this previous experience that we read from John, where at least one of them was a follower of John the Baptist. And they knew about uh, Jesus. And what John has said, behold the Lamb. And uh, uh, let's look at Salome. It's a Hebrew name which means shalom or peace. The wife of Zebedee, as it says in Matthew 27, 56, and the mother of the apostles James the Greater, who is who we're talking about, and John, who is the author of five books in the Bible. So Salome is an important character, an uh, early follower, not just a righteous female follower, but a true disciple of Jesus, uh, who came to Jesus, as we see, with a request that her sons uh, sit in the place of honor in the kingdom of God, as we see in Matthew 20. So not only was Salome uh, a uh, woman at that time, but she was a true devoted follower of Jesus who understood uh, the gravity of the situation, that understood that Jesus would be the Messiah and that he would be setting up a kingdom. What type of kingdom she didn't know, but she was asking that her two sons, James and John, be to the right and left in that kingdom when Jesus would come in his kingdom. We also learn a little bit more about her, that she was one of the ladies that followed Jesus and ministered to him and his disciples and was again um, uh, following at a distance at the time of the cross and the crucifixion. And three days later, on the day of resurrection, Sunday morning, she was one of the women that came to anoint the body of Jesus with myrrh and spices. So uh, we see the background that these two boys were children of Zebedee, who was a great fisherman, wealthy, and the son of Salome, who was a devoted follower of Christ. Now we have scripture portions for all of this, um, and we can go into more detail but time does not permit me. So let's talk about the call of these two boys. Jesus said, come follow me. And we see uh, the first instance where when they were, well, at least one of the two, might have been disciples of John the Baptist. And Jesus uh, said uh, that uh, when John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God, uh, they started to follow Jesus immediately. They understood the assignment. They understood what needed to happen, uh, that John was just the uh, person that would lead to Jesus Christ, and they started following him. But there was a more personal call that happened that we read, where uh, when they were back with their father mending the boat, uh, the net on the boat, uh, we see Jesus coming along and calling them formally. And we see uh, that they immediately left their net without any hesitation. So these boys had they weren't poor boys. They weren't boys that were just fishermen. If you think about it in today's context, fisher, being a fisherman at that time was probably the trade of being like 
the Microsoft CEO or something now. So uh, these boys had a lot to lose, right? They had a lot to lose. They had multiple ships, they had fishing business, and they left it all at the word of Jesus and said, when he said, come follow me. And we know that the inner circle of Jesus uh, was these three, uh, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew was given some uh, instances where he was allowed to be in the inner circle. We know that the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the brothers, uh, were able to see some things that the other disciples were not able to see. In Mark 5.37, we see when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, it was only these three present. When they witnessed the glory of Jesus on Mount Transfiguration, it was only these three present. When they prayed privately with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was going through that agony, it was just these three disciples. And when uh, Jesus was questioned privately on the Mount of Olives, as we see in Mark 13, 3, we see that it was these three plus uh, Andrew. So we know also that John, uh, Yohanan, was the a disciple whom Jesus loved, who leaned on the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. So we know that these boys uh, were fishermen that left everything, but in the end, we know that they were in the inner circle of Jesus and got to know Jesus intimately. They had the seven qualities of a true, genuine disciple of Jesus, which is love for one another, sacrificial service, genuine humility, mercy and forgiveness, perseverance through trials, and daily prayer and dependence on God for living, and committed to the Great Commission. When I, talk, when I thought about the, the qualities of a genuine disciple of Christ, these were the things that I came up with. So how do these men, the sons of Zebedee, who Jesus goes on uh, in Mark to rename them the sons of thunder? And why did Jesus call them the sons of thunder? Uh, because of certain personality traits that they had, right? Certain personality traits. How do they undergo a transformation from being the sons of thunder, first the sons of Zebedee, who left everything, to be the sons of thunder, and how do they end up being true disciples of Christ? So let's look at James, the son of Zebedee, or the son of thunder. James the greater, or James the elder, in contrast to the James that we've already studied, old camel knees, right? James who was the brother of Jesus. That's not who we're talking about. This is the son of Zebedee, James uh, the greater. And we know that he was born Jacob ben Zebedee in Bethsaida, in the small fishing town in northern Israel. He was in business with his father, Zebedee. He was the older brother, and um, he was very involved in the business, uh, likely. And uh, along with his uh, brother, John and Peter and Andrew, they left everything and followed Jesus, right? Jesus names them the sons of thunder because of their impetuous nature. What that means is they would jump for anything. They were uh, specifically two examples I'd like to show you. In Luke chapter 9, verse 54, uh, we see that Jesus at his very end was trying to go to Jerusalem. And he sent his disciples ahead to Samaria and said, make room for us in Samaria. And we see that when the Samaritans would not uh, accommodate them, when the Samaritans were vengeful, these boys were vengeful back and were fiery. Uh, they said, Lord, can we call down fire from above to burn down this village? So that was part of their personality, right? Sons of thunder. They were also selfish and conceited. You see, not only did the mother, who was a devoted follower, and I, I believe it's a good thing that the mother has good aspirations for them, but these boys themselves, we see, uh, they go and ask Jesus. They were close enough that you could ask Jesus, both James and John, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 20, uh, we see the mother's request. And in Mark 10, we see the request of both of these boys to Jesus uh, to say, let me sit on the right and left of you. So we see that they were called the sons of thunder because they had uh, ability, but they were also um, prone to many of the things that we uh, as early believers and disciples are prone to. We see John, the son of Zebedee, as well. 
We know that uh, he was also the younger brother uh, in business with his father. And we know that uh, together with his brother, he was known as the son of thunder. And that's because of their fervent nature, passionate, zealous, and sometimes insensitive, ambitious, and being overconfident in things. And the two examples that I just pointed out was with both of these boys together. So they wanted to bring down fire on the Samaritans instead of praying for them. And we know that uh, they were so zealous and angry at the Samaritans um, and wanted to bring down fire. And they wanted to be on the right and the left of the kingdom of God. And it's Jesus himself in Mark 3.17 that calls them um, that they are Borangis, right? Bo Boangris, which means the son of thunder. So it was a name that Jesus himself gave them. How do these two boys who were known as the sons of thunder with so much ambition, so much zeal, but sometimes misdirected, turn into amazing disciples of Jesus? They heeded that call that said, come and see, behold the Lamb of God. They went from being sons of thunder to be enveloped by the love of God. In fact, we know that John writes the most about love in the Bible. We, they went from fisher boys from Bethsaida to be uh, John writing five books in the Bible, right? And we know that Jacob or James was the one that was the first disciple of Christ to be martyred uh, out of the 12 disciples in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. They went from rugged fishermen to be meek men, but that time took uh, some time for a transformation. They went from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. They went from their impetuous nature to be the most loving guys you can meet. They went from their brokenness to wholeness. And how did this transformation take place? We see uh, James later as the apostle of passion. And we see that he was the first disciple to be um, martyred. When they asked, they and the mother asked Jesus to be on the left and right of Jesus, what was the response of Jesus? I don't think you guys know what you're asking for. Are you willing to drink from the cup that I drink? Are you ready to be drinking from the cup that I drink? And that's a lesson for each and every disciple here. Just to follow Christ is not going to make your life easier. In fact, uh, it is uh, fighting against the world and the worldly systems, right? Amen. Amen. So uh, we see that they had to give up that crown of glory that they were desiring for a cup of suffering. And they were hoping to rule with a scepter, but they got a sword of execution. Specifically, James was the first martyr, as you see in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. They were hoping for power, but instead, true discipleship, Jesus taught them is servanthood to be uh, serving others and washing others' feet. They were hoping for a prominent position, but instead, Jesus taught them that a martyr's grave uh, may be what you get just 12 years or a few years later. Uh, that's what happened to James, the apostle of passion. And we see that in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. About that time, Herod, Herod of all people, the king laid violent hands on some who belonged on the church, to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also, and that was during the days of the unleavened bread. We see that early in that first century church, uh, that uh, a lot of confusion, a lot of pain, was bought by the death of James. So when James was asking to be a true disciple, to be sitting to the right and the left of the Lord Jesus, he got his wish, but it is not in the way that he expected with power and position, but he got it in the way that a true disciple of Christ uh, needs to uh, carry his cross every day. Let's look at John, the apostle of love. We know that he is a prolific writer that wrote a gospel, gospel of John. He wrote three epistles, first, second, and third John. And he wrote the book of Revelation. He uh, was transformed from a son of thunder to a son of love. He became a humble, loving servant. He was uh, the one that was entrusted by Jesus on the cross to take care of his mother. That's how beautiful, that's how uh, graceful he was. 
And that is why the Lord um, said, woman, this is your son, and, uh, and uh, to John, this is your mother. We see that he carried this duty out faithfully until she died. He did not leave Jerusalem, and he was a man who was a humble and loving servant. We know that he wrote the most about love in the New Testament, which is a hallmark of faith. All our Christian beliefs hang on the fact that we need to have love for Christ and that Christ loves the church and that the Christians need to love each other. And all of that was taught by this son of thunder that was transformed by the love of Christ. He outlived all the other patriarchs uh, and died about 80, 98 under the emperor Trajan uh, and underwent the cup of suffering as well. He had to endure the death of his elder brother uh, under the sword of Herod, but he also had to endure the death of all the other disciples as martyrs, right? Uh, but at the very end, he um, died of natural causes, we think. And uh, before that, we see that under the uh, emperor Domitian, he was sent to the island of Patmos. He was in a cave, and the Lord appeared to him under that hardship and duress, and the Lord gave him the revelation of what is to take place in the end times, the book of Revelation. So we see an amazing example of growing in Christ, led by the Holy Spirit of Christ, and character transformation that takes place. Um, so we see a human model for righteousness that was converted from a son of thunder to a son uh, filled with the love of God. Jesus was uh, so close to John, we know that when Peter wanted to know who would betray him in John 13, 23, uh, it was uh, Peter who motioned uh, to ask John, who was sitting at the bosom or the chest of Jesus, to say, who is it going to be? That's how close he was. That's how close he was that he would uh, entrust, Jesus would entrust his mother to him. He was the only one that was brave enough among the men that were followers of Christ to follow him all the way to the cross, right? Um, be, maybe because he was a son of Zebedee and had some authority, but we see the courage. When everyone else deserted him, we see John had the courage to go all the way to the cross. And there were many ladies there, uh, but there was only one man of the follower of Jesus. And what did Jesus say? When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples standing by him whom he loved, we see in John over and over again, that John is referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. We see that um, uh, he said to his mother, woman, behold thy son. And then he said to the disciple whom he loved, behold thy mother. And we see a beautiful relationship that takes place there. And we see uh, John is writing all over uh, the books, uh, including John 13, about a new commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Um, that you love one another, the words of Jesus. By this you shall know uh, that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we see in the remaining couple of minutes as the worship team is coming up, um, we see this call, come and see, become fishers of men. This is not just a call for the first century church. This is a call for each and every person sitting here. Each and every person sitting here. And we can learn some amazing lessons from the life of Yohanan and Yaakov ben Zebedee, uh, J and J. You can see that you don't have to be perfect to start to do God's work. I believe some of the young people uh, in here, they think, man, I'm, 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 I'm messed up. I did something or I done something and I, it's not possible. I said, bring down fire. Or I said, um, I am angry at someone and they don't want to do the work of the Lord. But the lesson of James and John shows us that no matter where you start, the love of the Lord envelops you. As long as you hand the lordship of your life over to him and trust the process, uh, you might have your heart transformed uh, when you're saved at that instant, but your life is transformed in a system of discipleship. So what happened over the months, over the 18 months that they spent time with Jesus, and even afterwards with the help of the Holy Spirit, we see that they were able to be transformed in this system of discipleship. I thank the Lord that this church has a discipleship program and that people are able to be under the mentorship of others 
and become true disciples of Christ. True disciples, though, remember, will not be an easy life, but you'll have to drink from the cup of hardship just as James and John had to do. James had to die, and John had to endure all of the suffering, including what happened in Patmos. And um, we see, as long as you stay faithful in the persecution, he will make you into a masterpiece. Amen. We are the poems of the Lord Jesus. We are the masterpiece of the Lord Jesus. And we can learn lessons from James and John that we are a work in progress. So let's check ourselves to say, Am I the same that I was when I got saved? Or am I moving closer and closer in my love for Jesus? Or am I backsliding? Or am I getting closer each and every year into that perfect desired disciple of love, disciple of the way the Lord desires of me? You know, many of us think that we come out of the mold being a disciple, but this lesson teaches us no matter where you start, God is still working on us. He's chipping away like a, a, a working on a piece of wood. Or the other analogy is uh, he is the potter and we are the clay, right? He's continually working on us. When the thing is marred, the pot is marred, he doesn't throw us out, but he uh, fixes us and makes us the vessel that he desires of us. So let us look unto Jesus each and every day of our life and learn these examples from James and John and continue our daily life in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, obeying the word of God in the control of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you all.